we want and what's fair. Let's just look at what happens. Government gets involved. Remember, no unfair rates. The government wants to be a, a third party and determine the price, which we know is not the way you determine price. It's supply and demand. And the government just cups in and says, boom, 25 bucks. Tickets are 25 bucks. It's the same thing as the government telling a coal mine, you got to pay your people 10% more. That's the same exact thing. The same exact thing as the government coming in and changing the wages. It's the same exact thing as the government saying the ticket prices to the train are too high. We are going to, it's, it's actually exactly like that. That's not even a stretch. If the government says, nope, you can't charge guys $10 to get on the train. It's only $5. It's the same thing because that's a private train. That is not a government train. That's a train that someone built, that someone owns, and to walk into your business and tell you, nope, you got to charge $5 for a pizza. Same thing as the government $25 for a ticket. It literally happened in the past where the government told the train stations, you can't charge that much. What would you think was going to happen? Yes. If they're only selling tickets for $25 and they're paying him $154 million, it does not take a rocket scientist to figure out, yeah, they're going to lose money. And if they lose money, they go out of business. That's the way it works. The government should probably not get involved, but it's not fair. Well, it doesn't matter. It's fair to who? It's not like they charged $223 because they were throwing this giant party for themselves. They had to raise the ticket prices to pay for LBJ. That's what they were doing. And the government says, nope, it's unfair to the fans. And then the Lakers would go out of business. All right, well, let's, let's play it out this way. Let's say, you know what? How about the government, instead of regulating ticket prices, the government regulates how much basketball players get paid? What they can't do, they can't, didn't they just say that, didn't they just say that coal workers could get paid more? Well, that's, that's when the government decides someone should get paid more. Okay, well, I as a teacher, you know how my salary is determined? The government in many states has decided they will determine that what a teacher gets paid, not on how many hours I work, not on how good job, good of a job I do, not on whether my YouTube video has subscribers. It doesn't matter if anyone clicks on this link. It doesn't matter if this thing goes viral. You get paid based on, did you work one year? Have you worked two years? Have you worked three years? Have you worked four years? The government determines the wages of a teacher in many states, like the state I work in of North Carolina, regardless of any other detail, regardless, it does not matter how good or how bad or any of the other facts, all the facts, all the variables are thrown out the window. You've taught for five years. This is the amount of money you make. Stop asking questions. So yes, the government can get involved and say, this is what the wages are. So the government could get involved and say, nope, LeBron makes too much money. What do you think would happen in this scenario if the government says, well, it's unfair because when LeBron makes a bunch of money, the ticket prices go through the roof. So if we make LeBron make less money, then the ticket prices will be fair for the fans. Again, the government, a third party who's not involved in this, it should be up to the fans and the Lakers or the Lakers and LeBron, not the government. But yet, they get, like again, as a teacher, shouldn't your wages be up to the teacher and the school? No, the government steps in as a third party and makes this decision. Thank you, progressives. That is so progressive. That is such a new revolutionary idea that instead of what's worked since the beginning of time, which is the traditional view that people work out, the two parties involved, like a boss and an employee, we work out what I should get paid. No, the progressive new idea is the government steps in and they determine because they know what's best, because the government knows what teachers should make. Because, and I hope it doesn't sound like I'm complaining. I don't really care. I'm just using this as an example. I'm fine with my wages. I absolutely am. The government should decide what LeBron, because they're they are into advanced ba basketball analytics. They've studied LeBron's stat sheet. They've studied the videotape. They know about his leadership skills. They know what he brings to the team. And so they can determine, they're best to determine what his wages should be. Get out of here. The government should not be involved in this. And if they do get involved, LeBron's going to say, Pfft. Yeah. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go get a job. A, I'm going to go work in Hollywood. I'm going to make movies. I'm going to make a barbershop show. I'm going to make some sort of reality contest show like Steph Curry where we play putt-putt golf. That's what he'll do. 
because he's free to choose and he'll be pushed out of basketball because the government's getting involved in things they shouldn't get involved. But if the government stays out of this, then we'll figure it out all on our own. No government. Boom. So if you know anything about Teddy Roosevelt, the Washington Nationals have him as a mascot and he, uh, <laughs> he always loses. They finally let him win. But so this is just examples of Teddy Roosevelt, of me, Mr. Diedrich, serving Teddy Roosevelt and saying, come on, man. Now, typically when you listen to a social studies lesson, it's going to be, man, look at the progressive hero, Teddy Roosevelt, and all of his achievements. You very rarely are going to get someone that says, no, nah, these things that he did aren't good. You can look at it from both the sides. You can say, yes, he's fighting for labor, but you can also say, maybe the government shouldn't get involved. It's up to you to decide. You really don't have to choose. As I told you before, there's never a right answer. You can see both sides of this. It's best to understand all the sides. You can't really win. I'm sorry, this is not another class where you do a mathematical formula and there's an exact answer. This is not science where there's an exact definition and there's an exact rule. Social studies is mainly just not messing up all that much. As we said before, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. And you want to try to pick the best, worst answer. The meatpacking industry. At the turn of the century, pretty nasty, messed up stuff was going on. Was not regulated by the government. The government was staying out of this and let them, uh, the meatpacking industry, mainly in Chicago, was allowed to do their own thing. And unfortunately, that's mold right there, by the way. I don't know if anyone ever really notices that's mold. <laughs> and this is not like psilocybin. This is just mold. This is gross, nasty stuff. That is not good fungi. Here's another example. I don't know. I mean, I've never watched Ratatouille, but I, I don't know. I don't want rats messing with food. Anyway, so that was happening. Upton Sinclair ends up writing the book, The Jungle, because he wants to expose the meatpacking industry. Right? Like you've seen the guys on TV saying, tonight at nine, you find out what's really in your meat. Huh? What is really in my meat? Tell me or don't tell me. Does this mean I'm never going to be able to eat meat again? So Upton Sinclair writes this book and wants to expose the meatpacking industry. But what he really wants to do is he wants to call attention to the struggling immigrants. And he wants to push the country towards socialism, saying that these are the best answers. We need to take care of our immigrants. We need to take care. Uh, we need to become a socialist nation so that we're all equal. That's what the real point of this book is. Meanwhile, the country's like, uh, we don't really care about this. Shut up already. But we are interested in this because what's in my meat? Am I going to die tomorrow? What's going on? So he kind of fails to achieve what he's going after, which is socialism and talking about the plight of immigrants. But he does have some success in showing people about the dangers of the meatpacking industry and how it's very unsanitary. And that leads to government action and we have now the Food and Drug Administration, and our food is clean. It's going to be hard to argue against progressive Teddy Roosevelt on this one. This is a win. This is good. Uh, businesses are not infallible. They make mistakes, and sometimes they are greedy. And in their greed, they cut corners, and they create uh, unsanitary, unsafe working conditions. So now we have the FDA, and although the FDA is not without its own faults and failures, but they try their best and they try to keep our beef safe and our meat safe. So thank you, FDA and USDA. And those are government agencies. That's good government regulation. And here's a political cartoon of old Ted Roosevelt cleaning up, investigating the meat packing industry uh, alerted to us by Upton Sinclair. And Upton Sinclair would be considered a muckraker. What is a muckraker? It's a journalist or an author that exposes scandals, corruption, and injustice. We seems to be, we have a lot of those today, stirs things up. But back then, we didn't really, uh, there was just, this was kind of a new thing to call attention to problems in the country. So Upton Sinclair, he is a muckraker during the progressive era. We'll talk about a couple more of those guys. So again, like action news tonight, find out what's really going on at whatever this place is. It's a hidden camera, man. You're basically spying on this dude. That's not very cool. Unless, of course, you capture something really bad that's happening. So anyway, 91 degrees. Hot day today. McClure's Magazine is a magazine where you could find the stories that were written by the, uh, the muckrakers. Here, obviously, you're going to talk about the terrible, the horrible stuff that happens in coal mines. And this one talks about the probably the railroad industry and how they are 
unfair business practices. Stop with the fair word. Muckrakers, again, so another famous one is going to be Ida Tarbell, and Ida Tarbell is going to tell us about John D. Rockefeller and his monopoly and his unfair, let's say unscrupulous business practices. And he exposes, she exposes that to the country. The country gets upset. The country talks to the government and says, we need a change. And the government passes a law and eventually will break up his monopoly. Thank you, Ida. She's a muckraker. Jacob Reese. He will go around New York City and the tenements and take pictures of the terrible, the squalid living conditions. That's bad. That's bad. And obviously that's bad. Now, so it exposes this and then basically calls to attention. The government's going to fix it. And unfortunately, what can the government really do about this? What's the government? The government's going to say, all right, well, you got to clean it up and you got to have regulations. And what ends up happening is a lot of these people are going to have to get kicked out because when you force regulations on tenements, there was probably 15 people living here. And then the government's going to say, well, it's not sanitary for 15 people to live here. Only four people can live here. So 11 of those people are going to go out on the street how does the government really regulate it? So it's good. These four people are going to live in a very safe situation in a clean environment, but the other 11 are going to get kicked out. There's really nothing that government can do. I mean, thank you, Jacob Reese, for calling our attention to these terrible, squalid, dirty, unsanitary living conditions in New York City. But that's what happens when too many people move to New York City too quickly and the city cannot build housing fast enough. The government really can't do it. They can create regulations, but those regulations are going to force a bunch of people out onto the streets. And if we need new housing, the government can't really build that housing or shouldn't build that housing. It's up to the free market to build that housing. Another problem with Jacob Rees, well, I mean, it's still, it's, it's, it's something that needed to be talked about and, and a conversation that had to have happened. And you, the, the government tries to do what they can. This is just a tough situation for them. And it's good that the we know how the other half lives so that the country can't ignore it. But here's a, the problem with Jacob Reese. So we look at this picture. So um, these photos were staged. I'm just going to come out and say this real quickly. They're staged. They're, they're fake. Now, is there truth here? Yes. But these photos were manipulated. So you... If you, well, his assistants came out and said it, but more so if you know anything about the photography and the technology at the time, when you took a picture, people had to stand still. And it took a while for a photo to work. You couldn't move around. So basically everyone here has to agree, nobody move. Well, that's fake. Everyone here is perfectly standing and intentionally taking a picture. And these guys also didn't know that, oh, by the way, I'm going to need you to do this because we're going to basically make you all look like dirt balls. And we're all going to make you look like scum. And I'm going to title these pictures basically in that, in that vein. You think this guy's going to agree to like, oh, yeah, you're going to make me look stupid and dirty and bad? Cool. I'll just stand right here. Thanks, Jacob. No problem. They did not know how these pictures were going to be used. They did not know, but they definitely knew that I need to stand still. Right. Everybody here stays. You ever been on a street where everyone just freezes when it's not like some sort of a mannequin challenge? Those didn't happen then. Th these were all staged. I mean, this kid's like smiling. And that's not to say that this didn't exist. This absolutely existed. But there is a questionable, it's questionable in that, look, clearly he is trying to drive a point home. So do the ends justify the means? Is it right to kind of stage the photos a little bit, exaggerate it to make sure you send the message? Or should you just try to capture reality? That's up to you to decide. All right, last thing, primary elections. A primary election, we go through these every year. These are these were started then. This is part of the Wisconsin experiment. This was a relatively new phenomenon. So We'll go through this again in 2020, where a bunch of uh, Republicans or a bunch of de Democrats want to become president, and a primary is where we get to pick which of those guys will run. We decide between the multiple Republicans, we pick one Republican, and then that one Republican runs against the Democrats. Same thing. Right now, there are over 22 Democrats that want to be president, and so the people will decide which one of those 22 Democrats will be the guy that ultimately runs against the Republican. In the past, the people did not get to pick their candidate. In the past, the party 
picked the candidate for the party. The party leaders decided, all right, which one of you guys is the best Republican? And so the rich, the elite, the party, powerful picked the person. Now with primary elections, the people get to pick the candidate. It gives a little bit more power to the people. Because in the past, yeah, you got to vote for president. Before this, you got to vote for president, but the guy you had to choose from was already handpicked by the political party. The Republicans already picked their number one star, and the Democrats had already picked their number one star. Now the people get to pick, and then the people get to vote again on whether they like the Democrat or the Republican. So that is a general election. So you pick which Republican, and then the general election, you pick between the two parties, or you pick the Democrats, and then you pick between the two. So here's an example. In 2016, it got narrowed down. At first, it was like 15 guys. And then at the end, there was option one and option two for the Republicans. And ultimately, the Republican Party decided that this guy was going to be their guy. And that was the primary election. After he won the primary election, there was a general election versus Hillary Clinton. And she had to win her own primary. She was in a primary versus Bernie Sanders. And ultimately, the people, <clears throat> the political part, <clears throat> party, picked her. And then in the general election, they chose this dude. There it is. List and summarize Teddy Roosevelt's achievements. Many of them, but really you just need to remember the square deal. If you don't remember specifically what I did, like meatpacking or the railroads or the coal mine strike, or the forest. Really, you just need to remember the three things. Really, it's only just two. One, it's environment, enviro, and then two, it's business, which I'll write biz. And that's labor, protecting the workers. That's the consumers, protecting the consumers. And it's also slapping around the bosses. Muckrakers are journalists or authors stirring it up calling attention to problems like the meatpacking industry or the unfair practices of Standard Oil or Jacob Reese showing us the terrible living conditions in the tenements in New York City. And then last, a primary is when you pick the candidate, then you pick the candidate. Does that make sense? Well, whatever. We're done. No moss!